the podcast that floats down here. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the podcast that floats down here. I'm Melissa. I'm Ben. And I am Luke. And we are here discussing Stephen King's It, Dairy, the first interlude. This was 20 pages long and 1.83% of the book. Ben, tell us what happened. Mike writes in his diary in January of 1985 that he believes that Derry is haunted. Strange things happen in Derry, violent things, in cycles that seem to span 25 to 27 years that usually ends in a massive tragedy. Mike is an amateur historian, historian and spends a great, and deal, spends of a great deal of his time talking to old folks in Derry. There seems to be a code of silence in Derry, keeping people from talking about the darkest, strangest moments in Derry history. However, Mike has gotten a few people to speak and has learned about voices coming from the drains, murders that were allowed to take place in town, and hate crimes that seem to come out of the blue. These things happen in regular intervals, as though there is some force at work, some force that feeds off of violence and tragedy. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and go ahead and get into what are some of your random thoughts on this chapter? Um, well, first, uh, mine was uh, this takes place in uh, January of 1985, uh, four months before the phone calls were made to the six other losers. So it kind of helps to show that Mike's been dealing with this or uh, considering this for several weeks, if not months, knowing he's supposed to make the phone calls and everything. But he just he can't bring himself to do. He can't bring himself to put that on his friends again. And I thought it was pretty interesting, you know, seeing the struggle he's been he's gone through mm-hmm. with it. I like that he's the last loser, that we didn't get him in the last chapter. And nobody really mentioned him other than the random name on the phone. Well, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, it was definitely mentioned every single time. Right, but, but it was nothing just... Nothing really about him. It was like a disembodied name mm-hmm. that they didn't even remember. Most of them mentioned Bill as their, right. like, anchor memory, I think, I think if you will. Bill maybe mentions Mike in a little bit more detail than anyone else. Maybe. I th- I mean, I could be wrong on that. I think he mentions him in regards to the voice of the turtle or something at some point. It could be. But right. again, kind of just an offhand. Nothing really about Mike specifically. Yeah. I actually really like that we don't get an intro to Mike in the same way that we get to the other characters. Um, it makes him feel very, very different because they all had these relatively amazing but obviously lacking in something lives. They were all very, very successful. They were all, they all had a lot of money. None of them had any kids. They have, uh, Mike says in this chapter that he's been tracking them and sees a pattern that all of their lives have taken, but his is not. He's a small town librarian. He doesn't have a lot of money. He didn't, you know what I mean? Like there's just not anything about him that's anything the same as the other six. So I like that the introduction to him was not anything the same. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It just gets into him kind of, well, here's what I do every day. Here's what I'm up to right now. Right. There's not a whole lot of weirdness. Like, it's like looking, like piercing the narrator veil almost. Like, yeah. he's, he's very introspective about what he's doing. We're not learning about him. We're learning from him. And it was told first person even. Like, this right. is the only thing given in first person. Yeah. So, I like that. Um, I also like that Um, even though it's told in first person, this is the flashback. Because we know yeah. he already called them. See, that's where I think we mentioned it kind of one of the last chapters where it jumps around a lot. It still doesn't feel like a flashback to me. The stuff we get later on, like the next chapter, feels a little more flashbacky to me. But this is almost just like, well, this is just where we're being told. Yeah, and this is set. I don't the documentation of the buildup. You know, not you know, quite it a, doesn't feel like a specific flashback. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, I guess that's not the right word. I just mean it's interesting that we are told this in a first person narrative style. And yet, it happened before things we've it's, already it's, it's, seen. It's told in present tense, right? At a point, a timeline point earlier than, than what, what we've seen. seen. Yeah, which typically is how a flashback works. Yeah, and and, and I, just I, I agree. <laughs> I, I see why you're. It, just, it doesn't feel like a flashback no, to me because not, the whole chapter is set there, right? And it's not. And we like, definitely get as the book goes on, we will get solid flashback moments. This mm-hmm. is less of that, right? And that's that's the distinction yes. that I was 
making. So I, what I kind of liked in this chapter too uh, was uh, we get the major events of the previous cycles because we're already, we've already established the cycles mm-hmm. are a thing, uh, and like the burning of the black spot in 1930, the Kitchener Ironworks explosion in 1906, and then some other events in 1877, and so on and so forth, going mm-hmm. all the way back to the original settlers in, I think it was 17, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't get the year, but I want to say it was like 17, or no, no, uh, 1660 something, and uh, all of them were gone. In one year, 300 people up and gone. Mm-hmm. So we've known that something geographically in this area is... You missed the dismembered lumberjack group. That yeah. Well, that was the 1877. Yeah. That was that one. Uh, John creepy. Marson family slaughter. Yeah. yeah. Where uh, he, he ate the, the, the mushroom. Yeah, that was 1850, I think, or... Yeah, I'd like I said, I just didn't take the notes down. But the fact that there is a cycle and that Mike remembers enough of what happened to him to mm-hmm. be able to start looking for it. And then also have the balls, the wherewithal to keep looking for it. Right. You know, because he, he's been told by how, you know, whoever the the one guy, the older Al- guy Albert, is. Albert Carson. Yeah. Al- Albert Carson. Carson. The old you know, librarian. Yeah. Tell him, don't you know, leave it alone. You know, it's not going to end well. And Mike's like, mm, uh, gotta keep going. Yeah, I, I I really liked the historical digging he's doing. I think it's pretty neat. But nobody talks about it. Right, except for the, the old timers. There's a lot of us still around, but even they won't talk about that, even if you get them drunk. Right. It almost seems like this is being like the setup for Mike becoming one of the old timers. Like the way some of it read... Like when he was talking with Albert Carson, it was like there's still old timers around, and but there's always a new one coming in as there's old ones going like out. An old timer trainee, right? Yeah, an old timer <laughs> acolyte. Yeah. <laughs> well, and here's what's so the, the first time was apprentice <laughs> again. Like I, I read this book first almost twenty years ago, and I read it, and I was closer in age to the kids. And when I read these chapters about Mike, I'm like, oh my god, he's so old. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have white hair yet. I, you know, I have my glasses and the, and the water on the bed in case I get thirsty in the middle of the night. I do that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just so relate to that idea of becoming the old person. Not that I'm old and, you know, wrinkled and anywhere near retirement, although that would be nice. <laughs> not fighting it. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I know. I am welcoming. Let's go. Um, but it's more the idea of becoming a member of the I want to use the word wise but I don't really mean that because they're not always right. the, the old timers club yeah. like yeah. there's the definitely a group of right some kind of upper echelon of people who are aware of the things that go on and you don't always notice you're moving into it until you're there because I've noticed that at work in the last year or two like all of a sudden I am in that group where I work there's not a lot of people who've been there longer than me there's some yeah. but not many or you know like in the family gatherings i'm hanging out with our mom and aunt and they're like i like yeah i've moved up into that level of like not just adult but like beyond adult Mm because now everybody younger than me is becoming an adult so i veteran adult yes yeah been an adult for a while (laughs) it's it's the training it's the it's the old people training program is veteran adult yeah right yeah so it's what a got, weird feeling. What do you got next, Ben? Um, so found it interesting. Two bullies at, are dead. We find out uh, in 1985, come 1985, and a third one is uh, up in Juniper Hills, the Nut House. I wonder what happened to them and which ones are yeah, which. I was you gonna know, say they didn't specify which was which. No, they didn't. We just know two of them are dead. One's in the Nut House. I will uh, say on my first pass reading through it, I I didn't catch the two from the grave side yeah. i heard the you know one from the nut house for sure but then like going back i was like oh the other two are dead yeah didn't catch that <laughs> but i thought that was interesting yeah for sure um, well i wonder how long they've been dead exactly you know it, that's my other point say. yeah mm-hmm. i love the dark history of dairy i can only be a ima- i can only imagine being the uh, the one left to document the horrors that has gone on and everything. So like you're saying, like being Mike, the only one left or sick around, have her remember it. And there's gotta be something messed up in his head. I'm mm-hmm. just, <laughs> there might not be, but there's gotta be something. I think Derry is starting to take effect on him where it's, he may be getting a little accepting to a point. Like he, he understands it, but he's still not, he, you know, he, he can he's feel very it. aware of it. Of yeah. That, yeah. The feeling he, he definitely 
seems to be aware of. Yeah. But he also kind of says he's actively working against that. Exactly. One thing to go, kind of go along with that is when it has the line of the Gothic conventions are all wrong. My hair has not turned white. I do not sleepwalk. Yeah. I thought that was a pretty interesting line for how Mike assumes learning about these things would affect him. You know, because he is a librarian. He's read mm-hmm. a lot of old, like he even mentions Edgar Allan Poe, you know, H.P. Lovecraft, all those mm-hmm. types of old stories. These are like the, the classic horror tales. And he's the goth. He's just not feeling like those characters were portrayed but he feels like he should because the horrors he's seen are similar to the horrors in those books right but his response is different so he's concerned right yeah i just thought that was interesting because then he does go on to say you know he's aware of all of the things that he sees around dairy and how people act but i wonder if some of that is the um don't ask don't tell don't see don't hear mentality of dairy (laughs) then we're gonna shut it off because like, how does no one in Derry notice all those missing kids? How do they not notice that kids are missing and de- like at a higher rate than anywhere else? <sighs> mm-hmm. Well, the one nice thing is he doesn't, uh, you know, whatever it is, doesn't seem to preference age-wise. It can go anywhere from three years old to 19 years old, so. Well, and how old was Adrian Mellon? Yeah. He was in his 20s. He was in I was going to say, yeah. he felt like he was early 20s at least. That could be a big reason why it is still a small town. Because it is, you know, population decimation, you know, one out of every 10. Is it population decimation or is it um, natural selection? Well, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Either way, it's it's number checking. Yes. That's that's what I was getting at. Yeah. Yeah. So what? Mike starts it off by talking about the chapter being, or about the town being haunted. Can an entire town be haunted? Like, he's equating this to a you know, a ghost or some sort of entity. I wonder what he knows from when he was little or what he remembers yeah. specifically about what the thing is. Before we start maybe talking about that, I want to just mention sure. the distinctions that he makes on haunted, oh, yeah. haunting, and haunt. I thought that was really interesting because we, mm-hmm. we revisited it two or three times after he gave the definitions for each yep. one. Haunting being, haunted being, you know, a reoccurring specific thing. Haunted as some houses are supposed to be haunted. Often visited by ghosts or spirits. Haunting, persistently recurring to the mind, difficult to forget. To haunt, to appear or recur often, especially as a ghost. Or, a place often visited. Resort, den, hangout. And there's one more. There's another version of haunt as a noun. A feeding place for animals. So he clearly seems to see many similarities to those things, all four of those definitions applying to dairy. Yeah. And the events that he is remembering from earlier on and from what he's seen with Adrian Mellon a couple weeks ago. And hearing from his interviews. Right. That was like something he kept coming back to. So that was something that I easily picked up on. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, as of uh, the recording or the documentation in january you know the reason why mike believed that the start of this new cycle in 1985 started was the death of adrian mellon you know from the reports he's read on that i'm wondering what prompted him to make the call in may you know to the six because he said i'm not gonna do it you know one one more thing will have to happen yeah. yeah well it says so adrian mellon was in july a child found dead on Niebold Street last October. Another found in Memorial Park in early December, just before the first snowfall. Maybe it was a tramp, as the papers say, or a crazy who since left Derry or killed himself out of remorse or self-disgust, as some of the books say the real Jack the Ripper may have done. Maybe. But the Albrecht girl was found directly across the street from that damned old house on Niebold Street, and she was killed on the same day as George Denbro was, 27 years before. And then the Johnson boy, found in Memorial Park with one of his legs missing below the knee. Memorial Park is, of course, the home of the Dairy Standpipe, and the boy was found almost at its foot. And the Standpipe is also where Stan Uris saw those boys. Those dead boys. So it could all be a coincidence. Or is it an echo? He asks. It could be all nothing but smoke and mirages. Could be. Or coincidence. Or perhaps something between the two. A kind of malefic echo. 
that's, I think, what he's getting at, that not only are these things happening, but it's happening in the same patterns and the same sort of lead up to as before. We don't know what the May occurrence was. Right. The one that prompted the phone calls. But he's seeing a pattern of behavior. When Mike saying, I think it was meant to be us. He talks about the turtle a lot in this chapter, but him saying, I think it was meant to be us. So it sounds like his group, his seven losers or whatever, they were sort of the chosen ones to try and combat this thing in the 1958 cycle. Do you think other cycles had that same like sense of chosen people to combat? Hero group? Yes. A hero factor, if you will, or not. And then my second part of this is, do you think there might be a new set of kids from the 1985 section that were not necessarily being shown? I, I don't know. Uh, it's uh, very likely. I mean, I, I would – I don't know. That's a good one. I, I would probably say no. I think it's the seven were destined – because you're only looking, in fairness, let's say 300 years from the town's inception – so it is, you know, if you believe in destiny and all that kind of thing, a 300 year span of evil taking over and for the right convergence, that doesn't seem like a long time. You know, it doesn't seem like a super long time. So it's very possible that these seven were the ones that were meant to be. Or I wonder if whatever power pulled them together, like tried and it wasn't the right group. Yeah. And then that's very yeah. possible. I don't too. know. Something I, it was just, just sort of my pondering yeah. I mean, in the middle a... of the night last night as I was finally <laughs> writing notes. So. I have a couple couple more notes here. Uh, Mike being the only one from who remembers since he still lives there. But he also said that he only just started recently remembering. He's just started waking up four yeah. years ago. Right. So it's not like he's been sitting there living there knowing everything. It seems like he's just the, the first murder is the one that is clicking it back on for him. Right. And now he's had these four and a half plus years to start re remembering which we've already seen as soon as that veil is pulled from the other six's eyes mm -hmm. yeah. they quickly start remembering in whatever order that is but they all quickly start getting these floods of like yeah i mean they just like, i had no idea he was even was a child like it, they just never think of it so i think that he i think mike had that same thing with the first murder so i don't think he's been uh, sitting there remembering all this stuff growing up the whole time a bit uh because he the first murder didn't happen until 1984 and he started remembering in 1980 so like the adrian mellon murder is oh you know, yeah that's right so yeah. I, mean, I was I, thinking that the the first murder was 1980 but I, was, I, knew, I knew it was 1980 that he started remembering yeah, yeah. but and, I, what but clicked that off i don't know i guess i think it was just his age and he started remembering okay because he's known about the cycle even back when they were kids he had they kind of already figured out the, the well, cycle i don't know anything about that so but still, that's not a spoil, you know. He, well, it just did. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, but I think he took a break. And then once the time started coming back, that's what ended up opening up his mind. Since he, because he's been keeping track. Like I said, he's kept track of everybody, you know. See, I but don't, I don't I, think he kept track of them until 1980. I, think I get that the feeling was, that he okay. started doing all of this research from yes. 1980. So he's there, been working on this for three or four I, years. I really think okay. like 1980 happened and he woke up one morning and things started flooding back, similar to what happened with each of them after the phone call. Fair enough. The difference for him is that he never left Derry. So I wonder what his process for forgetting Yeah. Was it wasn't like, just running away from whatever it was when it was right. finished so, the last time. Yeah, so I'm wondering like... Which is just me assuming that's what happened. They all go away and the memories stay Yeah, I don't dairy. remember. So they, you know, they all... Everybody went through a process of forgetting, all seven of them. Whatever that process looked like for each person. The difference is something, and I believe it's some sort of outside entity thing, that decided that there needed to be a watchman in the night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, watcher on the wall. Yeah, right. Or the light tower. A sword in the darkness. Kind of. Yeah, yeah. Like the the watcher in the wall. I am the one who protects from the you know the protector of the, all the realms of men. Kind of. Yeah. And that, but it wasn't needed. Yeah. And that whoever or whatever is in charge of the watcher decided it was time and chose him in that moment mm -hmm. i don't think up until that point he had necessarily been chosen i think he got chosen because he was left i could see that i mean so the way i've been processing. working processing this you know in my assumptions and speculations mm -hmm. as we move forward is maybe 1980 was the beginning of the actual cycle maybe there's something in whatever this cycle is that trips five years 
or four four and a half years early, just for awareness purposes. But none of the killings, as Hagrid would say, start happening until you know a certain time period after. It's, it's almost so like which could be almost the same exact thing of what you're saying. Like it it, it could just be some other mentor or something that is the chooser of who the protectors are, whatever that is. Maybe they just are aware of it and, you know, poke the bear and wake him up or whatever. But I was just thinking that maybe that was a part of the cycle. So my, my final thought here is when Albert Carson, you know, right the month before he dies, he's talking to Mike again, and he says, It would take you 20 years and no one would read it. No one would want to read it basically telling him not to write the history of it and Mm -hmm. mike you know pretty much right after says i wasn't really planning on writing a history so much it's more my own note taking right um and problem solving for stuff that he clearly sees coming up again but yeah this this veil of don't ask don't tell in this town is it's just bizarre and i will say yeah and that's the one of the major plot themes Mm -hmm. of the book going on i would hope so because it's been talked about every single yeah pretty much every chapter (laughs) all right here we go (laughs) so we're getting into this section on new reader conundrums um so we're going to start us off with we have a question for you luke our new reader who or what is the turtle so the biggest piece of information we've gotten about the turtle in this chapter, compared to everything else we got, where it's just been mentioned for the most part, there is the line where it says, Part of me, the part that Bill would call the voice of the turtle, says I should call them all tonight. So, my brain quickly goes to, there are a couple options for what that could allude to, being something specific about Mike, something specific about each of them, like those seven protectors all have the voice of the turtle internally maybe that's part of what gets through the the dairy secrecy law i mean to me it seems like a conscience kind of thing it's an internal voice that mike clearly i think we're being told has but whether or not he's the only one that has it is my question now okay well it really that's my spec that's my guess i would say my only comment on that would be it's mentioned that Bill talks about the turtle. So I wonder right. if that and that's same voice lived, maybe lived in him in the 1950s <sighs> as, you know what I mean? Maybe he had that piece then right. if it's that watcher theory from earlier. Right. And that's and what I was thinking. Maybe Mike. all seven of them have it. And that's just what Stuttering Bill right. has coined it. Do you have any questions or thoughts for us? Uh, yeah, I've got a couple, not necessarily questions. They're more speculation thoughts that i can maybe turn into a question we'll see it could be speculations you're allowed like the the whole dairy company disappearance yeah. that yeah I, I liked that he specifically called out you know roanoke and how every yep. grade school kid in america knows about that and but see, no one knows about the say, dairy disappearance say roanoke i have no idea about that one personally oh I, yeah. yeah that's Go back to history. Do you, I know. Do your research. I, I know. I'm going it's, to. It's, 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 it's pretty book. interesting. Fair enough. Um, um, and it's, it's kind of similar theories that, because they still don't know what happened yeah. at Roanoke. They okay. don't know anything about what happened here. Was mm-hmm. it an Indian invasion? Probably not. I mean, it, An assimilation sure it into, like, right. you know, people who ran out of funds or money and food but it and just, assimilated into the culture of the Native Americans in the area. They don't, they don't know. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just interesting that all of this, if that is part of the same cycle, goes all the way back to westernized type history being put down yeah put roots in the area mm-hmm. which makes me think was it going on in this same area before there were even settlers like where um, like where it was like also the native americans yeah in the but area did it happen to them too and is that why there was no one there <laughs> like they were just like we're just going to get the hell out of here yeah. that's uh kind of something that i was interested in the whole betty ripsom Mm-hmm. And the conversation with her dad about how she was mutilated, and I think she was one that was found frozen to yes. the ground. The, when when her dad was talking about Betty's mom hearing voices in the drain, mm-hmm. and it almost sounds like it or whatever is able to get inside your head somehow and use voices and information about you. And then when her father, you know, talks about you know the sound of 
soapy water sucking down the drain. You know, he was listening to that when he was getting ready to go do some work outside or whatever. Right. And then he hears Betty's voice laughing. But it really sounded more like screaming when you listen a little bit close. Yeah. But it was maybe both. Yeah. It was kind of both. Exactly. Just interesting stuff. So let's get into what are our favorite things about this chapter. So Ben, let's start off with you. What was your favorite thing? Uh, my favorite thing is the dark history of the town, uh, basically going all the way back to the settlers. It's just interesting to see the cycle, to find out. And now the one thing that I found interesting was it always seemed, the cycle always seemed to end on one big note. You know, the settlers disappeared. Uh, the fire of the black Kitchener spot, the works. Kitchener Ironworks, 1958 didn't have a big one my favorite thing in this chapter is that mike remembers that he like hardcore remembers what we don't know what it is he's remembering but he remembers Mm -hmm. and it's dark and there is no there's no gray area for him he knows it all i mean obviously he is the catalyst for all the 1985 stuff not necessarily the killings themselves but anything that happens in 1985 with any of the other main group of characters it's because of his decisions because he remembers mm-hmm. can I just go along with yeah, that please. that he feels the weight of remembering mm-hmm. and he doesn't want to tell everyone else he doesn't want to have to tell everybody he knows he has to if it comes down to it but he is and he knows he should he is really holding on to that i just don't want to pull them down from well, from imagine- whatever lives i've already noticed them living so my i have a favorite line this this chapter it's kind of a description it's from albert carson it's a little bit lengthy so a town's history is like a rambling old mansion filled with rooms and cubby holes and laundry chutes and garrets and all sorts of eccentric little hiding places not to mention an occasional secret passage or two if you go explore a mansion dairy you'll find all sorts of things yes you may be sorry later but you'll find them and once a thing is found it can't be unfound can it some of the rooms are locked but there are keys. There are keys. I, I really like his description, Kings, and the character of Albert Carson, because he clearly knows a lot more than he's mm-hmm. told Mike. But he's giving him the information that Mike needs of just keep looking. Open if the you doors. If you want to keep going, it's up to you to do so. Just keep looking for those keys, because there are plenty of rooms. Right. There's a lot to find. It's very Yoda and Empire Strikes Back with the whole are you scared? Well, no, you will be. Yeah. You will mm-hmm. be. And like it's that same sort of idea. Yeah, that not same cheesy. feeling with the yeah. beware. Like, yeah. but he, he had the, the same line earlier where he was just like, well, if you're going to keep going, just beware. And then he has like the dot, 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 beware. <laughs> so, uh, that was a little cheesy for me. That one was a little cheesy for yeah. me. Oh, uh, man. No, no, I, I going on to your point, Luke, really quick. Uh, I do think it's fitting, you know, because he he won't give him all the information because it is something you have to find on your own. It's part you, of the journey. It's part that, of the journey too. Yeah. yeah, to feel the to feel the weight of exactly whatever this is. Yeah. Well, and he also sounds like somebody who has embraced the fog. Yes. Like I know there's stuff there. I know some of it, but I'm not going to go there because once I open myself up. I can't unforget. Yeah. And I've already forgotten once. Oh, I didn't I didn't get that out of it. But I can see I can see that. Yeah. Right. That's like, not just it's what there. I there. Yeah. I know some things, but I know I knew more. I and decided I don't not to know. open these doors. I decided not to keep looking for keys. Right. I got enough. I stopped. I got enough for me. So I'm not gonna help you. And that wraps it up for this particular episode of Floats Down Here. Feel free to join us on a variety of social media websites that you can contact us with your notes, thoughts, and, you know, telling us how wonderful we are. We are on Twitter at Floats Down Here. You can email us at floatsdownhere at gmail.com. You can find us and our family of podcasts at thepodcastthat.com including the ability to subscribe to Audible and get a free book on us at our website. If you go to the podcastthat.com slash support us, click on the Audible link and you can get a free audiobook and a free 30-day trial and it helps us out a lot. 
go to iTunes, subscribe there to our podcast. Feel free to leave us a five star or other star, but five is great rating. We would appreciate it. Join us next time when we discuss chapter four. Ben Hanscom takes a fall. You'll float too. Stay imaginary. Thanks. Thanks.